Hello, welcome to this National Credit Union Administration webcast on consumer financial protection issues impacting older adults. I'm Ken Worthy, Financial Literacy and Outreach Analyst with the NCUA's Office of Consumer Financial Protection. I will be your moderator for this presentation. Before we begin, please follow along as I review the information on your screen. Please adjust the volume on your computer so you can hear the webinar clearly. To increase the size of your slides, drag the bottom right corner of the presentation viewer. Please allow pop-ups from this site for it to function properly. Download the presentation by clicking on the PDF under the resource list widget. Use the ask a question feature on the left side of the console at any time in order to ask a question. We hope to address these questions at the end of the webcast if time permits. In approximately three weeks, this webinar will be closed captioned and available for on-demand viewing on ncua.gov. The views and opinions expressed on this broadcast are those of the presenters and do not reflect the official views of, nor should be considered an endorsement by, the NCUA's Board of Directors, its management, or staff. During this broadcast, we will share an update on important issues impacting older adults in order to help credit unions support the financial well-being of their members and the communities they serve. We encourage credit unions to share this broadcast with your members directly through your website, email newsletters, social media, and other avenues. Our presenters include Matthew Bellaris, Director of NCUA's Office of Consumer Financial Protection, Alan Sorcher, Assistant Director with the Office of Investor Education and Advocacy at the Securities and Exchange Commission, and Bradley Lipton, Deputy Director of the Office of Financial Protection for Older Americans at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. To get us started, Director Bolaris will provide remarks on why we are focusing on issues impacting older adults and the important links between financial literacy, consumer financial protection, and the credit union emissions. The director will also provide an overview of NCUA's resources available to credit unions and the general public. Director Bolaris? Thank you, Ken, and thank you to everyone joining us this afternoon. I want to extend a very special thank you to our guests from the CFTB and the SEC who are joining us today. Before I begin, I want to remind you to visit NCUA's website focused specifically on coronavirus. This site has a wealth of resources, including uh, frequently asked questions and answers for credit unions and credit union members. We've also posted relevant resources and information from across the federal government unique to this pandemic. Let me help frame our discussion this afternoon by highlighting a level of commitment for financial literacy efforts demonstrated at the highest level here at NCUA. On screen here, you see a quote from NCUA Chairman Raji Hood. It reads, the NCUA regards promoting financial literacy as fundamental to the credit union mission. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the great work credit unions do to promote financial literacy to their members and the communities they serve. Your participation in events like this is a testament to your strong level of commitment. Under the Federal Credit Union Act, promoting financial literacy is a core credit union mission. The NCUA works to support these efforts by raising consumer awareness to help them make informed financial decisions, reinforcing credit union efforts to educate their members, and increasing access to credit union services. The NCUA also encourages credit unions to continue with this important work, particularly when it involves elder financial exploitation and frauds and scams targeted towards older adults. On this webcast, our presenters will share some of the latest information on COVID-19 related frauds and scams targeting older adults, as well as information and resources that help combat the rising prevalence of elder financial exploitation. And for contact, 
Elder financial exploitation is defined as the illegal or improper use of an older person's funds, property, or assets. Perpetrators may include a wide variety of people ranging from close family members to offshore scammers. This topic is especially timely to discuss with World Elder Abuse Awareness Day coming up next week on June 15th. This special day represents an opportunity for communities around the world to promote a better understanding of issues affecting older persons, including financial exploitation. Other interrelated factors make raising awareness of these issues so important for credit unions and the communities they serve. For example, as this slide illustrates, there are demographic changes underway in the United States. In fact, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, older adults, which the Census Bureau indicates as people over the age of 65, are projected to outnumber children for the first time in U.S. history by the year 2034. They are expected to make up around 21% of the population, or approximately 77 million people. For some context, in 2016, the percentage of older adults was around 15% of 49 million Americans. As more Americans age, the effects of aging can lead to cognitive and physical decline, which can cause financial impairment and dependency on caretakers. Dating back to 2011, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, advised financial institutions to use suspicious activity reports, or SARS, to report elder financial exploitation. Since then, recently released an analysis of elder financial exploitation suspicious activity reports filed between October 2013 and August 2019. As you can see, FinCEN's analysis indicates that our elder community faced an increased threat to their financial security by both domestic and foreign actors. This graph gives us a very strong visual on how SAR related SARS related to elder financial exploitation are steadily on the rise. Note the steady increase in the number of monthly SAR filings in the circle area involving elder financial exploitation throughout 2019 and now approaching 7,500 filings a month. Depository institutions and securities and futures identified family members and caregivers as most often responsible for thefts from elders. According to CFPB, studies show that financial exploitation is the most common form of elder abuse, and yet only a small fraction of incidents are ever recorded. Estimates of annual losses to older adults have ranged in the billions of dollars. While generally older adults are more appealing to scammers because of the wealth they may have accumulated throughout their life, many older Americans that are near retirement age lack adequate savings and the ability to withstand the financial shock of a scam. Many consumers at and near retirement are unprepared to meet retirement challenges. For example, four in 10 late baby boomers, those currently ages 51 to 59, are reaching retirement with limited or no savings and are projected to face a savings shortfall. While the data available is alarming, large gaps still exist in empirical evidence leaving the full scale of these issues and many related questions unanswered. However, considering the age of our population, it is probably safe to assume that elder financial exploitation and related scams will continue to grow. The impact of these types of scams have on older adults can be devastating. I know firsthand of the financial and mental toll, financial loss and mental toll these scams can have on people as someone in my extended family lost their house and life savings to some scammers targeting older adults. We know that credit unions are uniquely positioned to help an older member detect and prevent fraud and elder financial abuse. Specific actions by credit unions include providing financial literacy education, financial counseling services, and training staff to detect and report elder financial exploitation. If I could refer you back to 2013, in September of that year, the NCUA issued letter to credit unions number 13-CU-08 and accompanying interagency guidance. This guidance clarified that if a credit union suspected an account holder may be a victim of elder abuse or financial exploitation, 
the credit union can report the suspected abuse without violating the consumer's right to privacy. This guidance also urged credit unions to review their policies and procedures and ensure staff is trained to recognize signs of financial abuse or exploitation. So I would encourage you to revisit that guidance and review your credit union's policies in this regard, given some of the statistics we'll provide this afternoon. And before I hand things back over to Ken, I would like to quickly go over some of the other consumer financial protection efforts and resources the NCUA has made available to help credit unions assist your older members with combating elder financial exploitation and other scams. Just last fall, we conducted a webinar that provided credit unions and examiners with an update on certain provisions of the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. Specifically, Section 303 of this act extends immunity from liability to credit union employees who disclose the suspected financial exploitation of a senior citizen defined as age 65 or older to a regulatory or law enforcement agency subject to certain training conditions being met. Please watch that webinar for additional information on how this provision may serve your credit union membership. To help educate older adults, caregivers, and credit union officials, NCUA developed two videos available on YouTube. The first, Scam Targeting Seniors, illustrates how an older consumer could become the victim of a scam. We encourage credit unions to share the video on their website, through social media, or during financial literacy events. The second video, Reporting Elder Financial Abuse or Exploitation, explains to credit union managers and staff how to spot, prevent, and report cases of financial abuse. This helpful video can be shared with credit union staff during training programs. This slide also reiterates the letter to credit unions we issued in 2013 to address those certain exceptions under the privacy rules for reporting suspected fraud or potential elder abuse. So please refer to that for additional guidance. Finally, NCUA's consumer website, mycreditunion.gov, offers free educational information and resources for credit unions and their members, including the NCUA Fraud Prevention Center, which helps consumers learn how to recognize common scams and take action if they think they are victims of fraud. It also provides useful tips for protecting their finances. So I hope you find this broadcast helpful to your continued efforts. And now back over to Ken to introduce our first guest speaker from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Ken? Thank you, Director. As we transition to our next presenter from the CFPB, a reminder, please submit any questions you may have into the ask a question box and we'll try to answer the questions towards the end of this broadcast. And now I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Bradley Lipton, Deputy Director of the Office of Financial Protection for Older Americans at the CFPB, who will discuss some of the recent developments on scams and other consumer financial protection issues impacting older adults. Mr. Lipton? Thanks, Ken. It's um, great to be here today. I really appreciate uh, and to you NCUA for inviting me to participate, and I particularly enjoyed seeing some of our uh, research uh, put on the previous slide, so it's really great that that's getting out there. Um, as Ken said, I'm, uh, I'm actually acting as the as deputy in our office for older Americans, but I have deputy assistant director here at the CFPB, and I want to talk to you today about, um, first, what we're seeing um, in, from, from consumers, what we're hearing from consumers during this COVID pandemic um, on a variety of different issues, and then uh, let everyone know about CFPB created resources on um, might be useful to um, share with your members and, and with consumers um, during this difficult time. So, starting with um, what we're hearing from consumers, um, oh, I should give you my disclaimer. Uh, you, you all can read that. I, don't, I won't read that loud uh, for you, but the, the keeping is that the opinions or any opinions or views presented. They are my own and may not be the Bureau's opinion. So a little bit about the CFPB. Um, our mission is regulating the offering provision of consumer financial products and services under the federal consumer financial laws and educating and empowering consumers to make better informed financial decisions. Um, I'm here today as uh, in particular in that educate and empower consumers function. That's uh, part of the office of uh, CFPB that I work at um, is the consumer education function. Um, and particularly the Office for Older Americans where I work, um, we develop 
initiatives, tools, and resources to help protect older consumers from financial harm, help them make sound financial decisions as they age, and also help stakeholders um, like you by providing tools to support long-term financial security for older adults. So briefly, I just want to talk about what we're hearing from consumers. This is from our consumer complaint database, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, this isn't um, credit union specific. I'm not picking on credit unions. This, this is market-wide uh, data. But we did, did, did do some analysis of what um, we, we, we've been hearing from consumers over the last few months. And I thought that might be helpful for people to hear and to learn about. Um, so, so we uh, our research people did some really good analytics um, about particularly complaints related to the COVID pandemic and then did the, the, some data analysis. And I'm going to uh, give you the, the high-level version of what that analysis revealed. Um, this information is also available on our website um, and in much more detail um, analysis of the market-wide data. So if you're interested in that, you can find that on consumerfinance.gov. Um, and so specifically, um, we have com complaints mentioning coronavirus by product. This is the analysis. You know, you'll notice that mortgage credit card and credit card are at the top there, and somewhat below that is uh, credit, consumer reporting, debt collection, and checking your savings accounts. That actually is um, the, the, the biggest takeaway uh, from this consumer uh, complaint data is that there's a, a big shift during the COVID pandemic. Um, a, a, a much we've had a record high volume of, of complaints generally during the pandemic, but in, in particular, uh, a disproportionately larger number of those complaints have been about mortgage and credit card as well as, well as checking your savings. If you look at those bars, and a disproportionately small of unusual number of complaints have been about uh, debt collection or, or credit or consumer reporting. So that was a bit of a shift in uh, the difference of what we were seeing before the pandemic. So um, that's, as I said, I'm just going to be brief on the, on the complaints moving on. Um, the CFPB is committed to supporting consumers during this time, um, giving them up-to-date information, resources, et cetera. And we also have our consumerfinance.gov uh, coronavirus page. Um, and in particular, we are updating this content all the time. Um, there are lots of different resources. Um, this is, a, I, I believe, that the current version of the page on your screen right now. Um, but we update it all the time, and they look a little bit different right now. Um, we started with English language resources, and then we, from there, have been translating our resources into many different languages: Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Tagalog. Um, and then yeah, we're increasingly adding videos and other multimedia content. Um, I encourage everyone to uh, check this page since we're finding that it's just coronavirus. The content's really good. And um, it, although it's primarily safe to be content, there's also content from uh, other parts of the federal government that we've been posting on there. I'll just give you a sense of the types of content. We have content about protecting yourself financially, submitting complaints, protecting your credit. This is all consu uh, primarily consu consumer facing content, I should say. Scams, mortgage relief, tips for financial caregivers, dealing with debt, student loan repayment, um, and then some information about the uh, yeah, IP payments, the economic stimulus relief payments. So, really, a wide range of resources at, at consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus. Um, in particular, one thing that I would add that is, it's, it's on here, but I would uh, emphasize we're particularly proud of this housing portal. We, we got together with um, a couple other government agencies and tried to provide a, a comprehensive uh, source for information about housing and, and during the coronavirus pandemic. So um, it's a really good resource, um, information about mortgages, rent, uh, rent, rental properties, a whole bunch of things that I really think are really useful for consumers. So we also have some social media resources, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, putting stuff on, on, all, up there all the time. As I said, these videos um, are maybe what we're most excited about lately. Um, we've been getting great feedback and you know, a really record number of hits on these. So we're really getting a lot of interest from consumers on all these resources, particularly the videos. Okay, so to give you a little bit more sense of the content, um, focus a little bit about the, the uh, webinar about older adults. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on the older adults. Uh, segment of the content. So we have some coronavirus resources specifically for, uh, uh, useful for older adults. Um, two sets of resources which I'll, I'll really emphasize. Um, the first is uh, tips for financial caregivers. Um, one of the ways to uh, connect with people whose money you, uh, you help manage while observing virus prevention tactics like social distancing and quarantines. And then also, this is part of the first category, online and mobile banking tips. Um, these are both things, uh, resources that we created um, where you know, we're, we're just cognizant that um, people like caregivers um, who are used to seeing being uh, in, in touch in, in person with, um, with people that they take care of 
uh, would not be able to do that during the uh, coronavirus pandemic, or at least would be, be a hindrance to doing that. And so we, we, we thought about, well, what are tools that um, consumers who are used to doing things in, in person and in, in touch um, could use that would be helpful during this time? And so we, we think about ways to, um, you know, what, what are ways that people can connect that are uh, other than in-person people are used to connecting in person. So, so with online and mobile banking tips, um, our thought here was that older Americans you know, uh, may be uh, comfortable banking uh, in person more than they are online. And, you know, of course, during the, the coronavirus pandemic, you know, that's something that might change. So we wanted to give online and mobile banking tips uh, about, you know, to help them get started and to really uh, for novices who are haven't been doing that before. Interestingly, this, this tool has been uh, proven useful, not just with older Americans, but of course, um, lots of other people have, uh, are used to doing their banking online, uh, not online, but rather in person as well. And so um, this, this research has actually been used by people of all ages. Um, but those are two things that we're specifically thinking about, um, you know, ways for Deputy, people to... Deputy uh, Director Lipton. Deputy Director uh, Lipton, yes. sorry. Um, we're, we're just, we're having some audio um, uh, issues and we can't hear you clearly. I'm not sure if you can speak a little bit closer to the microphone, perhaps. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just, we had a couple of comments come oh, in. Uh, and wanted no, to make sure no, folks thank can you. hear you. Oh, um, no, thank you. Um, thank you for, can, can you hear me now? I think that is better. Thank oh, you. Oh, that's better. Awesome. I'm wondering if it's a mic issue on my end. Sorry about that. Um, and please do interrupt me again if, if you can't hear me next time. Um, I'll be able to hear me. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's the thing. These are two resources that we created that we thought would be helpful for people um, who are used to doing things in person and might, might be um, thinking about ways to get people acclimated in the, in the current environment. So then we have a second set of, of resources, which um, are really about scams. Um, and so these are also somewhat similar resources, protecting yourself financially, um, beware of scams and avoiding scams while finding help during quarantine. One thing that we've no, uh, been hearing from consumers and from stakeholders is that all of these scams that were in existence before the coronavirus pandemic are still there, um, many of them with, unfortunately, a coronavirus spin. Um, so you know, scammers are... Uh, you know, uh, clever people and, and find ways, unfortunately, to take advantage of the current situation. Um, so you know, that last block there, the avoiding scams for finding help during quarantine, um, that's a, a, what we call the Aaron Helper uh, scam. But uh, one, one thing that we have seen pop, popped up is um, people who are hearing, um, who are hearing, we're hearing the, the scam, that, which is the classic scam of people offering to help you um, with household tasks or other things has really become a coronavirus scam. So. We have tips there for encouraging people, things to look out for, how to avoid that particular scam. Um, but then we also have uh, other content about different types of scams more generally, um, based on what we're, he we're hearing about uh, these scams that have become more prevalent during coronavirus. They're not, they tend not to be new scams, um, but are sort of a different, different twist, a different take on the uh, classic scams that we've seen. So once, for example, one scam, one report that we did here was a grandparent scam, which is an, an, an old scam we're all familiar, many of us are familiar with. Um, where uh, someone contacts an older adult tending to be their grandchild and in distress, and unfortunately, seeing that take on a coronavirus uh, tint where people claim that they get stranded far from home due to the coronavirus and can't get home. So um, we updated our materials that, um, to, 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 to uh, account for those types of scans and to, to be coronavirus specific. So... Um, these, uh, some of the resources I wanted to tell you about today, these are, are more on scams. These actually aren't coronavirus-specific resources, but they're evergreen resources that uh, we thought would be useful um, just generally uh, for consumers you know, during this period. Um, so um, these are resources that we, uh, TV has had on our uh, website for a long time. Uh, but Money Smart for Older Adults, Adults, um, this is a community-based program where um, people can offer training materials and other guides for people in their own community to uh, train older adults or uh, really for older adults to train each other on avoiding scams and other financial exploitation. Um, and then a few other things are uh, fraud prevention placemats. Um, these are a popular tool that can be uh, downloaded or well as ordered from us for free in bulk. Um, we find a lot of financial institutions distribute these to their members. We've actually refreshed this content a little bit. It's no longer just placing that, but we, we have uh, content that's available um, that's in various different sizes. So uh, we're finding that a lot of resources developed for the group home setting, um, sorry, the group dining setting, 
um, it is being used in a variety of other settings. And many similar with money guides, that's uh, a tool for financial caregivers and protecting residents, that's um, giving resources and ideas for assisted living and nursing facility staff to uh, watch out and, and look for financial, warning signs of financial abuse. And as well, available on consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans. Finally, uh, thank you. Uh, oh, am I ta are you having trouble hearing me again? No, sorry, go ahead, Deputy Director. Okay, uh, so uh, finally, a few more resources that, um, again, not, not COVID-19 specific, but we thought might be useful uh, for consumers during this time, a version of the stressor guide, um, sharing information with your staff now to avoid problems later, a virtual valuables guide, and planning for dimension capacity. Um, these are, again, all available uh, to some time respect of special in there. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Deputy Director Lipton. We really appreciate it. I um, apologize to some of... Uh, our, our viewers are, who are having issues with audio uh, will we'll try to uh, um, slow down a, a little bit so that you can hear us more clearly uh, just in general. Uh, our next presenters and during our Q&A, we'll, we'll try to slow things down a little bit. Um, we had some uh, um, viewers having issues following. Um, but uh, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Director Lipton. Uh, excellent information. As we transition to the next presenter, uh, from the Securities and Exchange Commission. Please remember to, to submit any questions you have in the Ask a Question box, and we will do our best to get to them at the end of this broadcast. I'm pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Alan Sorcher, Assistant Director with the Office of Investor Education and Advocacy at the SEC, who will discuss some of the recent investor-related developments on COVID-19 scams and other, other issues impacting older adults. Mr. Sorcher? Thanks, Ken. Um, I'm uh, thanks to you and to uh, Matt and the NCUA for including the SEC in this webinar. Uh, COVID-19 scams and uh, scams targeting older Americans are important topics, and we are happy to be able to share our information. Um, like Brad, I've got a disclaimer, too. Um, the SEC requires me to give it. So this is not a statement of official SEC policy, it's not a legal interpretation, and it's not investment advice. So what am I going to cover? Uh, the red flags of fraud that we see in many of our cases, of course, coronavirus scams and other investment scams related or otherwise targeting seniors, and some steps to protect yourself. Okay, here are some of the common red flags that we see in many of our cases that they keep coming up. Number one, many scams sound too good to be true. Here, investors need to trust their instincts. If you offer promises, high returns with little risk, or even better yet, they say it's guaranteed, it's probably a scam. Two, don't be pressured to buy right now. No legitimate investment requires a rash or quick decision. Three, watch out when there's no prospectus or an offering memorandum or anything in writing. Four, Make sure any investment professional you use is licensed or registered. And the key is to check our website, investor.gov, and I'm going to talk more about this. The red flags are important because if your radars are set to these red flags and you're on the lookout for this, uh, you can help avoid a scam before you turn over your hard-earned money. One more red flag, unsolicited offers. An unsolicited offer comes, is one that comes out of the blue. Be careful when you didn't seek out the investment or the salesperson making the offer or investment. If you're tempted by the offer, do your homework, do your research, or better yet, perhaps walk away. Let me turn to now coronavirus investment scams and other related scams. Scam artists often use the latest news developments or national crises to lure investors. We've seen this with flooding, tornadoes, hurricanes. It happens. Some are now using COVID-19 to promote bogus investments. They're falsely claiming that products or services of their companies can prevent or cure a coronavirus. So here's what to look for in these fraudulent stock promotions. Watch out for stock promotions that look like research reports and predict the company's stock price will hit a certain target price. A common false claim may also be that the company 
is converting its operations to somehow benefit from the COVID crisis. The way these fraudulent stock promotions typically work, whether coronavirus related or some other false claim, is through an investment scheme called the pump and dump. And these pump and dumps have been around for a very long time. They usually involve penny or microcap stocks. And these penny or microcap stocks typically have no business operations. What happens? The promoters hype or pump a stock to attract investors. You might see this on social media or on the web. And as investors buy the stock, as you can imagine, the stock price goes up. And that's when the promoters who own most of the stock sell or dump their shares. What happens then? When the promoters dump their shares, the share price plummets, and the investors who got suckered in are left with worthless shares. You don't want to see this happen to investors. What has the SEC been doing? The SEC has suspended trading in many companies that have had questionable claims of products or services related to coronavirus. The importance of that is that stockholders in a company subject to a trading suspension may not be able to sell their shares until that suspension is lifted. Let me talk briefly about charitable scams. There may be charitable scams involving COVID or coronavirus. What happens? Farces tell you that the investment will help people with COVID-19, feeding on your desire to care and help, but they actually steal your money. Bottom line, make sure the organization you are considering is on the IRS's tax-exempt organization list. Bogus CDs. During periods of market volatility, investors may seek less risky, less risky investments like CDs, certificates of deposit. But you must be careful. We see there's a lot of fraud with CDs that are promoted online. Fraud targeted at seniors. Another type of fraud to be aware of is affinity fraud. Let me repeat that, affinity fraud. We call this affinity fraud because it's where a member of your same cultural, ethnic, or religious community, or someone pretending to be, seeks you out, hoping to use the affinity or trust between you as a way to scam you. As I'll discuss in a minute, you need to check the background of any seller or investment professional before you invest, even if you share a common background with that person. Okay, how do you protect yourself? Three steps. One, the first step to protect yourself is making sure you're dealing with a licensed or registered investment professional. Before you use an investment professional, make sure you check them out, as I said, on our website, investor.gov, which you can see right there. That's the mobile version. Typing their name into the box that you can see on our website will show you whether the investment professional is licensed or registered. You can also see their employment history and any other red flags in their background. Second, research any investment product. In addition to checking an investment professional, you can also research the particular investment you're considering. We have a tool on our website, it's called EDGAR, that's an acronym, it's not somebody's name, that allows you to research publicly traded companies. The important thing, the key thing to find out is whether the security or product is registered with the SEC. I'll repeat that, the key thing to find out is whether the security or product is registered with the SEC. And this is critical because we see many scams involve unregistered companies, ones you won't find in Edgar. Last thing, provide emergency contacts. If you have an investment professional, like a broker or investment advisor, you should consider pro providing that person with an emergency contact in case they can't contact you or suspect something is wrong. This is especially important with older Americans and seniors. In fact, broker dealers are now required to ask account holders to provide an emergency contact. Okay, I've mentioned investor.gov several times. It's our website for individual investors. We publish a lot of information to help protect investors. It's all here. Um, it's all free and it's easy to navigate. 
We have a page dedicated to seniors or older Americans. It has articles, resources, and other information to help seniors who are investors. Importantly, we put out investor alerts uh, every couple weeks or so focused on emerging frauds and other issues in investing, many focused on frauds targeting seniors. Here are just a few examples. Wrapping up, uh, this is our contact information. If someone has, has a question about investing, we have an investor assistance hotline, call the number, 800 number, 800-732-0330, or you can email us at help at sec.gov. Uh, we have a number of people who are dedicated to helping the investing public uh, and welcome calls if people have questions. Um, that's it, Ken, for my uh, presentation. I realized I did not include a picture of the coronavirus itself, um, but next time I do a presentation, I'll make sure I, I include a picture of that ugly-looking coronavirus. Uh, Assistant Director Sorcher, thank you uh, so much for uh, all that great and helpful information. We're getting positive feedback already from uh, many of you listening. So thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. A reminder, uh, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and type it into the Ask a Question box. Before we take questions, I want to remind all of you listening that we have uh, resources for consumers and credit unions on NCUA's uh, Consumer Financial Protection and Financial Literacy website, mycreditunion.gov. Uh, you can go to mycreditunion.gov, search elder financial abuse, uh, and you'll be able to navigate to those resources, and we include links to uh, the CFPB's resources as well as the SEC's resources. Uh, now I will go and check our questions here to uh, ask our first question. And our first question is for uh, uh, Deputy Director Lipton. Uh, we have a really timely question here. They, they heard the news from your office regarding the announcement of a new resource to fight elder financial exploitation called the Elder Fraud Prevention and Response, Response Network's Development Guide. Uh, could you please give us a bit more information on what that is and how credit unions can use this new resource that just came out yesterday uh, to help the, their communities and the members that they serve? Oh, what a great question. Um, I'm really excited to hear that someone saw the resource. So, yes, as Ken said, yesterday at the TFPB, we released, released this new Elder Fraud Prevention and Response Networks Development Guide. Um, that's available at consumerfinance.gov slash elder networks. And um, we've been studying uh, collaborative networks to prevent elder financial exploitation for a long time at the CFPB and also helping to facilitate these collaborative networks around the country for a long time. Um, these are networks that may include financial institutions, adult protective services, law enforcement, or others in the elder justice space. And um, we admire these networks for a long time around the country and help, help to seed them. And what we heard from practitioners in the elder justice field was that um, really the most useful thing for starting up these networks as well as expanding existing ones was ready to use resources. Um, you know, people in the elder justice field are working full time. Um, they may be participating in a network to help uh, prevent elder financial exploitation, but they, they really, uh, to generate new content is really quite difficult um, when you're working full time and, and participating in a collaborative network um, as, you know, something of an extra job. Um, so we created this, what we call the Networks Development Guide um, to provide those resources. It's really turnkey resources um, that people can use uh, to plan uh, network activities, like a network building retreat, um, a collection of a really database of different resources um, for people involved in collaborative networks uh, to build and grow and expand their network, and a variety of other tools ranging from um, Excel spreadsheets, PDF PowerPoints, um, a retreat facilitator guide for people who are hosting a meeting, so really a variety of different tools. Um, as I said, that's consumerfinance.gov slash elder networks, and I encourage everyone to check it out. Um, it's a brand new tool that we just released yesterday, um, but it builds on um, a bunch of years of research and also work in, in the field. So I th really think that's going to be a helpful thing for people to use. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Director. Uh, now we have a question perhaps for um, Director Belaris uh, regarding 
uh, what resources are available to train credit union frontline staff to identify and respond to signs of elder financial fraud and exploitation? Uh, yes, thank you, Ken. That's a good question. Um, I would direct people back to my comments I made about the videos we have posted on our uh, mytraining.gov and also on our YouTube channel. I think the first one, I'm looking at my notes here to make sure I'm right. The first was scams targeting seniors, uh, which uh, illustrates how older consumers could become the victims of a scam. The second was reporting elder financial abuse or exploitation. Um, if you uh, if you search mycrating.gov for scams targeting older adults, you should find this page. Or if you want into a YouTube channel and uh, search for elder financial abuse, I believe that'll pull up the video channel. Um, the other thing I'd add too, in terms of resources for, for help and train, um, I think Brad had mentioned the Mike Money Smart for older older adults. That's a joint effort with the CFPB and the FDIC. That's a really good resource site, and uh, you can find that by searching for that on either the CFPB or the FDIC's website. Back to you, Ken. Thank you, Director. Uh, now we have a question for Assistant Director Sorcher uh, regarding how, what can older members do to protect themselves from investment fraud? And then there's a second part to the question, uh, how uh, the, the questioner is asking about uh, additional information about how uh, about the scams targeting pertaining to certificate of deposit. If you could explain that a little bit more, uh, it was in your presentation, I believe. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, I knew I'd get a question about that when you're doing a presentation to uh, the, uh, the NCUA and deposit or, uh, and entities. So as far as how to protect yourself, uh, really basically five steps of which I touched on, but really worth repeating. Because, um, you know, the SEC goes after people after they've violated the law and gotten people's hard-earned money. But uh, seniors, investors, consumers can help protect themselves and be proactive uh, so they don't, they don't turn over their hard-earned money. Number one, as I said, be alert to the red flags of fraud. They matter. Uh, they happen, and we see them happening, the same three or four red flags in all the cases we bring across the country year after year. So being alert to those is critical. Two, always check to make sure you're dealing with someone who's licensed or registered. Um, we think that it's so important. We've been running a public service campaign for the past four or five years reminding Americans about that, the importance of it. And the reason is that a lot of the scams that are conducted against individuals are done by people who aren't licensed. So really important to check and make sure. Three, um, I didn't say this in my presentation, but it's critical, ask, ask questions. Don't be the one who's providing the information. Ask questions and push back on anyone who's trying to sell you an investment. Four, as I mentioned, provide an emergency contact, really critical for seniors and older Americans who may not, may be losing some of their mental, mental abilities and have diminished capacity. So it's really important they have somebody that can be contacted if something looks, looks suspicious. Uh, and then lastly, uh, if someone has a question, uh, they think something has gone wrong, they don't understand what, what something's happening, they can call our investor assistance with our 800 number or our, uh, or our email. Um, to the question on the bogus CDs, um, the ones that are offered online uh, are often just frauds. They're not CDs that are offered by the insure depository institutions, um, and they make lots of claims trying to lure people in. So people should research them to be very careful if they're going for a CD that is offered online. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question, uh, perhaps uh, to um, Deputy Director Lipton, is just a general question about how to protect personally identifiable information online. Uh, perhaps there are resources from the Bureau that uh, might be helpful. That's a great question, and there's a variety of different resources that we have. You know, nothing, there's no, no specific guide um, that comes to mind right now. What I will say is that in our online and mobile banking guide, um, that, that does get into the topic of protecting personal identifying information and has tips for consumers about that. So that's something that I would uh, refer you to. It's not a dedicated resource to, to that topic, but I think our online and mobile banking guide is probably the best thing in terms of consumer-facing materials. Wonderful. And I'd also uh, mention uh, our Consumer Financial Protection and Financial Literacy website at NCUA, mycreditunion.gov 
has some great uh, tips for you to protect your personally identifiable information. Uh, some best practice on is on how to use your mobile device. A, a lot of um, folks log in to uh, public Wi-Fi spots, which can be dangerous when you're logging into your banking information. Some really good tips that you may not uh, think of are on MyCreditUnion.gov on our Fraud Prevention Center. Uh, the next hey, question. Ken, Ken yes. this is Matt. If I could just add one more item to that, too. Um, on our website, in addition to what we have on MyCreditUnion.gov, um, under our um, regulatory and compliance resources at NCUA.gov, there's a cybersecurity resources that has got a wealth of information. Some of it's very technical in nature, but it does talk about scans, protecting privacy, and protecting personally identifiable information that's got some good press pra best practices. So that's another resource uh, credit unions can share, either, you know, among themselves or with their members too. Thank you, Director. And we've reached the end of our broadcast. So thank you all for uh, the questions that you've submitted. We really appreciate it. We got through a couple of them and we'll hand it over now back to you, Director Belaris, for our closing remarks. Thank you, Ken, I appreciate it. Uh, once again, thank you to everyone who joined us this afternoon and a special thanks to our team guest speakers, Brad Liston from the CFTB and Alan Sorcher from the SEC. I also want to thank our own financial literacy analyst, Ken Worthy, for moderating our session. We hope you found this information helpful and reminder, please contact NCUA's Office of Consumer Financial Protection with any additional questions, comments, or concerns, and be sure to visit mycreditunion.gov um, to access the entry resources as well as other resources of other agencies like the SEC and the CFTB. Thank you for your time this afternoon and stay safe. Ken, back to you. Thank you, Director. As I mentioned earlier, in approximately three weeks, this webinar will be closed captioned and available for on-demand viewing on ncua.gov. Thank you for tuning in. This concludes our webcast.